Last year, um, I actually started looking at all of the open source ecosystems that we have any kind of data on. Um, and, and by ecosystem, I mean people that are publishing packages in that language that other people can use. And so you can get some data from GitHub, but uh, the really good data actually just comes out of the package managers. Um, and what I started doing was asking certain questions of this data um, that nobody was really asking and, and people were making a lot of assumptions about. Uh, the most important one being, you know, is, is growth somewhat stable and predictable? Uh, can we actually predict that growth? And then um, if it is predictable, then, then what does that actually tell us about how open source ecosystems grow? Um, and one thing that I did uh, that actually did, worked really well was rather than start charting the absolute number of packages and focusing on that, um, I charted growth as a percentage of the ecosystem as a whole. So, you know, if you had 1,000 packages and you added 100, you would have 10% growth. And if you had 10,000 packages and you added 100, you would have 1% growth. Um, and then the next quarter, the next time that you measure the growth, it's going to be, you know, that much harder to reach that growth again. And so what you would expect is that all of the ecosystems with, with those numbers would be coming down, right? It's getting harder and harder to grow at that rate. And certainly some open source ecosystems are dying. Certainly some of them people are, you know, not really that into, you know, like, come on, like, nobody writes Haskell. I bet Haskell is, like, dying, right? Um, and, uh, but, but actually what I found was, was pretty startling. Um, it turns out that no open source ecosystem is dying. Uh, it turns out that all of them are actually growing at a pretty sustainable rate. Um, I mean, they do fall a little bit, but over a couple years, you're looking at a half to 2%, right? Um, but some are growing dramatically more than others. Um, and that led me to, to disprove two like, really important assumptions that we've been making for a long time. Um, one was that you know, these numbers were unpredictable. You know, they are. They're actually very predictable. Um, this, uh, this graph, I, t I took that, those, those numbers, those, uh, basically the average growth per quarter, uh, and I abstracted it out for the next uh, three years at the time. So uh, this goes to the end of next year. Um, and Isaac uh, texted me the other day and told me that uh, last month, we, we, oh, we went over 100,000 packages a node last month, um, and this predicts it about down to the day. Um, and this was made in April, this graph was made in April of last year. So about a year and a half afterwards, it's holding very, very true. So if it continues to hold true for about a year, we're gonna be you know, close to 300,000 packages. Um, we're gonna be double the size of Ruby. Um, that's, that's pretty tremendous. Um, but the other more important assumption that this totally destroyed was that um, Oh, the growth of one ecosystem is at the expense of another. That when Node grows, it's because people are ditching Python and they're ditching Ruby and, you know, they're, or, you know, when Go is growing, it's because people are jumping ship from Node because, you know, TJ wrote a blog post. Um, and, and this is actually not true. It, it turns out that open source uh, ecosystem growth almost entirely comes from what you could call non-consumption, right? So that's non-consumption in terms of people that are writing code and not publishing open source packages. Um, so if you make it easier uh, and you have a culture of participation where people want to publish and they're incentivized to publish, then they will, so you get a lot of growth out of that. And then you also get a lot of growth out of uh, what you could call amateurization. So taking a task that used to be only accessible to a couple really smart programmers that knew how like fucking B-trees worked and stuff, and then you make it super simple and easy for almost anybody to use, including, you know, high school dropouts. Um, and then, you know, they make awesome websites with it. And really creative stuff that people who know how B-trees work could never do. Um, and, and so, like, that's, that's really important, because if you're trying to grow an ecosystem, you need to learn these lessons about how things actually grow. So I was paying attention to this graph for a long time, been paying attention to the massive growth of Node. You know, now we are by far the largest ecosystem uh, in the world. We're still the fastest growing ecosystem in the world, uh, although Packagist is, is bring, bringing PHP up there, so PHP is having another growth spurt again. Um, and no mumbles, it's, it's still okay, it's some stuff. Um, all right, but uh, what I wasn't paying attention to with, uh, until recently was, was this graph. Um, this is the contributions to node core graph, um, and it is decidedly not growing. Um, you know, you can see that over the last couple years, uh, we've had sort of a, 
a smaller decline, and then in the last year, a pretty huge decline in the last, looks like two or three months, um, we're getting pretty close to zero. Um, and considering that we have the largest ecosystem in the world, we have, you know, we're the fastest growing ecosystem in the world, there are a lot of incentives for people to want to contribute to Node. Um, and they're not. Um, they're, they are decidedly not contributing to it. Um, and th this, is, this is both a problem, but also, you know, like, why? You know, we have this great project, people are clearly using it, why aren't people contributing to Core? Another more concerning, even more concerning graph is this one. This is the number of stable releases per year of Node. So you can see that e even all the way through 2013, we're, we're doing a lot of stable releases. I mean, this includes patch releases, right? So bug fixes and security fixes and that kind of stuff. Um, and then this year, we have just this huge decline. I mean, there's a month left of this year, but it's not going up much. Um, and you know, we, we had two huge security problems this year, right? Like two huge security like SSL fixes that had to go out. So that's you know, two of these uh, seven or eight releases. So we're also not releasing. So the code that is getting in, we're not getting it out the door. Um, people are starting to kind of wonder like, what the hell is going on with this project? Um, and you know, if I were to show you the, uh, the NPM update graph, which is the number of updates to packages. So not just new publishes, like we saw in the previous graph, but also people continuing to maintain and update packages. You'd actually see that that graph, that graph grows even faster than the number of uh, package, like new packages published. So you know, updates to things and continuing stable releases inside of the ecosystem is growing tremendously, and then it's, it's not happening in code core. So if we want to fix this, we have to figure out what works, what is working in the ecosystem that we're all participating in um, that's growing like crazy that now has, you know, 100,000 modules, uh, and what parts of that are not true for core, um, and let's make them true for it so that we can potentially fix this. So this is a, a visualization, a simple, uh, simplified visualization of the level up ecosystem, um, and there's a lot of other uh, ecosystems inside of NPM that look a lot like this, right? Um, you could look at uh, some of the stuff that Mikola Lashenko does with ND Array, and it would look a lot like this as well, where you have sort of um, layers of different modules that accomplish different tasks, and then they sort of have these different dependency chains on top of them. Um, and in a lot of cases, actually, there is this sort of linchpin module, the module that sort of like is at the center of this little ecosystem. Um, and when you, when you really break down NPM, what you find are lots of different clusters of things. And sometimes they're around something like level up, but sometimes they're just around a person, right? Like, you know, Substack and Dominic Tarr and, and Max Ogden, like they, they have a bunch of modules that they use together in certain ways really often, and they form this little sort of ecosystem. Um, but there, there's a few things that you need to know about this, right? Like one is that um, all of these independent modules are run by different people. Um, there's a certain amount of ownership uh, that goes along with these smaller kind of single maintainer modules. Um, and uh, they, they're they basically able to operate completely independent of each other. So nobody's anybody's boss, nobody owns anybody else. Um, and the only time that that isn't really the case is in this level up module, right? So le level up actually is in a similar position to, to what you could call node core is, right? Like a lot of people depend on it on both sides of the stack. Um, and so, it, it, w it should exhibit a lot of the same problems that Core does, um, but it actually doesn't. So this is a really good thing to look at and to try and figure out you know, ways that we might improve Node in the future. So uh, this is Rod Vag. Rod uh, is the creator of Level Up uh, and is still one of the, the primary maintainers. Um, a really great guy, great addition to, to the Node community. You'll see his name pop up a lot the more that you get into things. But uh, Rod decided to run the project very, very differently than we'd seen a lot of open source projects run before. Um, and he, he came up with this new system that he called uh, Open Open Source. Uh, I don't think that the acronym actually means anything. He just capitalizes it to reinforce the fact that it's fucking open open source. Um, but <laughs> Um, open open, th this is the first line of the contributing uh, file for, for it, and th this is the description of open open source, which is that uh, individuals making significant and valuable contributions are given commit access to the project to contribute as they see fit. This project is more like an open wiki than a standard guarded open source project. So uh, it turns out that Git is like really good at removing mistakes. 
Um, you can't screw up Git the way that you can screw up like a subversion repository. Um, and a lot of these crazy kind of safeguards and hierarchies that we have around giving people commit access, they're really not that warranted anymore when we can revert things so simply and easily, right? Like we may want to guard the keys to, to doing releases and pushing releases to NPM, but in terms of like actually guarding commit access, that's not all that necessary. And so he sort of figured this out. Uh, he added this to the project. He started just giving commit bit to anybody that sent a patch that was more than four or five lines long. Um, and what ended up happening was a lot of people, including me and Dominic Tarr and uh, Paolo Fregameni, and all of the people that sort of depend on level up on every side of this ecosystem, they all got commit access and they all had a shared sense of responsibility for the project. And it's, it's easy to, to con somebody into having a shared sense of responsibility for some time. You know, you can say like, oh, you know, I really believe in you, write this stuff, and then, but if you don't give them ownership over it, if you don't, like, if you don't treat the, if you don't act as a participant yourself, if you don't come with a pull request just like everybody else and you sort of continue to act like a dictator, people start to understand that they actually don't have any ownership over this um, and their participation will go down a lot and their sense of responsibility over the project will go down quite a bit. Um, and, and for the people that, that don't do that, they'll just burn themselves out. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll get so care mad about everything that happens and they'll sort of flip out and it's all because they, they feel a lack of control over their own work. Um, and this model that, that Rod came up with has been hugely successful in avoiding all these pitfalls. You know, there's, a, there's an amazing, active, and engaged community that shares ownership over the project, uh, and it's, it's maintained very, very responsibly uh, without you know, all these crazy safeguards that we sort of obsess over. Okay, so I'm um, gonna talk a little bit about Node School. So a lot of people have, have been to Node School. We, there was one here. Uh, people have talked about Node Schools a lot. Node School, um, it, it really sort of came out of, uh, out of, the, out of the Node conferences. So uh, NodeConf 2012 uh, Substack wrote this little stream adventure uh, workshopper. In fact, uh, we, for, for that year, I decided that NodeConf was just gonna be all hands-on. And so most people just collaborated on building slides in the whole curriculum. And uh, Substack tried to do that for about five minutes before he flipped out uh, and was like, screw this, nah, and, like, uh, and then he's like, I'm just gonna write a module. And so he writes this module that's you know, an interactive workshop uh, that was by far the best workshop that year. Uh, everybody really loved it. Uh, Tim Oxley loved it, or Rod Vag loved it so much that um, when he went to Tim Oxley's conference, uh, CampJS, a few months later, he, he rewrote all of his uh, workshop materials in a very similar format so that you could have this sort of interactive presentation style. And then a few months later at NodeConf EU, there's you know, five of these interactive workshops and we put them all under this banner and call it Node School. Uh, and it really took off from there. Um, and then shortly after that, I, I created this issue. And this is like my favorite GitHub issue in the history of open source. It's so great. So I'll, like, I just sort of put together resources for people running localized node schools in their town or whatever. Um, and I said, you know, hey, run one. You know, when, when you're done, like, totally come back and, and tell us all about it. And, so, and this thread just blew up for months. So t tons of people were running these. They were coming back and saying what worked and what didn't work. We were all iterating on how we did them. Uh, and you know, people started sending in all these awesome photos and attaching them uh, to the issue as well. So, you know, these are from, and these are from all over the world. I mean, you know, you've got London and China and uh, Australia. Uh, I think there's a little bit of San Francisco in there. Um, Colombia, like there's Medellin, Colombia is in there. Uh, and this is all happening within like the first few months. And uh, we were so excited that we, we kind of didn't notice when uh, growth kind of plateaued. Like we had a bunch of new people come and run them. And then we, we basically exhausted, I guess, the number of people that could just figure this out from that issue. <laughs> um, and it, it stagnated for a little while. Uh, and then, you know, Max Ogden, who you, who you may have seen earlier, um, he decided that he was gonna sort of like take on some, some more leadership and organize things a bit. And what he did was, one, he just documented very, very well how to run a node school. You know, you don't need it, any money, you don't need to pay for pizza and beer unless you want to, like, just, you know, it's very, very simple, you know, here are these materials, that's it. Um, but then he, he found a way to, adop to adapt uh, Rod Vegg's open open source to this like new growing community 
of node schools. Because one of the problems that you have in, in distributing this project is like, well, how do you share ownership over something that is literally global and people are running them in their local, in their local community? So you created this node school GitHub org. Um, and basically, anybody who comes along and says, I want to run a new node school, they get added as an owner of the entire org. And then from there, they create a repo for their local node school chapter, which you know, means that they get a website. Um, and, and also, that GitHub repo ends up being an issue tracker for them to organize the event and for anybody that was at the event to follow up later. Um, and then, then he did something just fucking genius. Um, he, he told them that at the end of every node school, they should get the GitHub handles of everybody who attended and add them as an owner of the individual repository. So now they're all watching the repo, they're all following up, and it makes this line between, I just learned Node, I know a little bit more about Node, now I'm helping out to run a node school, now I'm mentoring. It, it makes that continuum and that transition so simple and easy. And it, and it, it, again, it, it shares ownership of, of the localized event, which means that people have a shared sense of responsibility for keeping it running. It's really genius, and it's worked incredibly well. And now we're, uh, I'm on the owner's thread, so I, I know about every single one that comes in, and it's like two or three a week are being added. It's crazy. Um, and then, you know, I have to unsubscribe from this repo because it's like all in Japanese, and I'm like, I don't know. Um, and, and, uh, and just recently, you know, Max has uh, been on a kick of trying to get everybody to, to translate as well. So there's a ton of translations for the Node School website, We're trying to translate all the workshoppers. There's a new concerted effort to try and distribute ownership of that as well. It's gone really, really well. Uh, another thing uh, Max put together uh, in, in Oakland, the, the hometown of Node, um, is uh, Oakland JS. So the, the reason that I bring this up is that you know there's, everybody's been to a meetup probably. Meetups are very common. Oakland JS is just a little bit different. Um, it's not a thing where people go and talk uh, or pitch. There's no speak. There's no speakers at all. Um, we we have it at this sort of outdoor beer garden. Um, and it's just a place for people to come and relax and sort of continue to build a community over a long period of time. And the secret to its success is that we do it every week. Um, and so nobody is there every time. Nobody is even in charge of making it happen. It just happens every week, and people just show up every week. And you don't have to feel weird about not showing up or showing up again. But one thing that this has started to do is that for the first time, we're attracting a lot of non-programmers into programming into this local community. Um, because one thing that we, that we found out uh, through the node schools is that people, if people can reach out to, to someone that they've met, um, they're far more likely to follow up if they're really new to programming. There's certain things that are just terrifying to ask online. Um, in fact, one thing that the local node school chapter started doing that I've been stealing really liberally is that they started creating Gitter chat rooms for their local node school. Um, and at first I was like, well, why? Like, if people want help, they should just go to like a, a main node school one. But no, it's actually done, done really well because people who will go to these local events, they'll have a question and they'll just be terrified to ask it of anybody except the people that they just met at that meetup. Um, and so having sort of like, you know, weekly informals and having, you know, these localized support systems really help us bring in what will eventually be the next generation of new programmers, right? Like these are, these are possibly people that aren't gonna be full-time programmers, but it, you know, they're gonna work in civic government and they need to process some data and they wanna know how to do that in, in a way that works on the web. Or you know, they work in education and so they have an interest in this and it's gonna help them do their job. But you know, they're not gonna work at a fucking startup. Um, and that's great, because we don't need more startups. What we, <laughs> we need are more, more people writing useful shit. Um, so <laughs> But um, yeah, so like these, these are all just great things. And like uh, here, here's a couple more photos from um, from our local uh, Oakland JS. And you know, it, literally, like we don't even have the same table each week because we don't have a reserved space. So people just have to kind of look around and try to figure out like where laptops are. And then it's like, oh hey, there you are. Um, and I started bringing like those little bits, and now we're playing with those all the time. But it's just been really fun. Um, and. We notice people coming back week after week that just would never come to a meetup, um, and we're really pulling them into this uh, into this community, and we never would have been able to get them any other way. So I highly suggest doing something like this. Um, but okay, so the future, right? This is future town. Uh, so wh what does the future of Node look like? Um, that's what the talk is supposed to be about, so I better bring it back around. Uh, so the future of Node is it's actually you, um, in that 
you know, Node is a participatory culture. Everything that we've succeeded at, we've succeeded at because we have a participatory culture and because we've been amateurizing these, these tasks. And now we have to move on to the next phase of that, which means like all of you need to participate and all of you need to, to get involved in ways that, you know, we have some examples of before, but you know, we need to find new ways to collaborate and new ways to get involved. So the, the first is, is, you know, local. Like, if you don't have a community in your town, you can build one. If you do have a little one, you can grow it, you can make it more cohesive, and it's really not that hard. Um, and there's now a lot more resources. So you can run a node school. There's incredibly detailed uh, information on how to run a node school. Um, I mean, literally, you know, dozens of people are running them every month. Um, you know, all of the workshop or materials are there for you to use. It's, it's a really, and it's a really great experience to be a mentor and to teach people things. You'll actually learn a lot by teaching other people. Um, if you, if you've, if you know, you have a bit more of a community, you want to bring in some, you know, out of town speakers and really get people in your, in your city or town excited about, about Node and about JavaScript. Um, I started doing this thing called NodeConf OneShot. And uh, I liberally stole from what Max did with Node School, um, and essentially documented how to run a very simple, very stripped down one day conference. It doesn't cost a lot of money, it's not that hard. There's instructions on there on how to do a really great CFP and how to select good talks. Like, you know, really anybody can run these. Uh, we've, we're gonna do four of them this year. Um, there's, you know, already two on the books for next year. Uh, so really, if, if you feel like you want to step it up another notch, uh, check out one shot. Okay, and then there's Node Forward, which pr everybody's probably been waiting for me to talk about. So, um, so Node Forward, it, it's, it's a GitHub org that I created um, and a campaign that a lot of people are now involved in where we're really just trying to get Node Core back on track. Um, and not just Node Core, but we're trying to solve a lot of the problems inside of the Node community and ecosystem that aren't solvable with just one module, right? They do require the collaboration of more people inside of the ecosystem. Um, and so some, some great examples of this are um, onboarding. So new people come to JavaScript and Node and they land at API docs. Um, and you can't learn shit uh, if you don't know anything about Node already, it, just by looking at API docs. And there are a lot of great resources that people have built for, for learning JavaScript and for learning Node. I mean, Max Ogden wrote this amazing uh, one called JS for Cats that is literally, you know, a cat's guide to learning JavaScript. It's adorable. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, you know, a Node.js handbook and there's all these great resources. There's even Node School, but um, finding them and seeing them laid out in a cohesive way that says, you know, I would want to go and do this really isn't there. So um, Tracy Abrams and a bunch of other people are leading this really great effort to sort of consolidate some of this material and build a website that is basically a landing page for new Node users that we can start pointing people at. Um, and, you know, if you're into documentation, you're into usability, you know how to make pretty websites, like, you can help out with this. Um, so just go to this repo and pitch in. Um, the next is help. So I don't know if you've ever been on the Node.js mailing list, but it's, it's a cesspool. Um, it's just, it's the worst. Um, don't go there. Just don't. Unless you want to know a lot about fibers. Um, it's... So, but, and, but people like legitimately show up with real questions and they're like, help me. Um, and then they learn about fibers instead. Um, and so we, we've been trying to fix this for a long time. I mean, Forrest Norvell's done a great job of moderating the mailing list, but it's still just not like a super accessible thing. Um, so we created a, a GitHub repo and we're using the issue track you, tracker there for people to ask uh, questions and help. Uh, but we also actually have a Gitter room because um, we've, we've found that uh, Gitter, just being on the web and being simple, we're getting people that won't pop into IRC very simply, very easily. So um, if you want to help people, you know, you can, you can watch this repo to provide help for people. Um, you can pop into that Gitter channel and help any new users out. Um, we're, we're already getting a, a pretty good amount of people come popping in, um, and uh, Forrest is sort of leading that project along with some other people. Um, the next one is one that I'm, I'm getting pretty excited about, because we've been talking about it forever, but it's always kind of stalled out and, and not gone anywhere, but now it's really happening, uh, which is basically a sort of like global open source mentorship program. So uh, essentially the idea is that, you know, a mentor signs up and says, you know, I know about this kind of stuff. I can dedicate about these many hours a week to helping out a new person. And then they get on, you know, a Google Hangout or a Skype or whatever with new people that come along that, that want to learn more. 
Um, and one, we sort of like build a lot better relationships with newer people and pull them into the community like really deeply. Um, and also, it's a, just a good educational effort. So right now, uh, you can go to that repo, uh, and then uh, the README has a list of mentors, and if you're up for mentoring, then just send a pull request and add yourself, and that's a great way that you can help out. Um, then there's some core stuff. So we have, a, we have a discussions repo for any other problems that I haven't talked about or any new issues. There's already some threads there that are, that are bearing some fruit. Uh, one is the, the first one that I added to the repo, which is called All the Maths. Um, but uh, essentially, I don't know if you know this, but uh, R and SciPy and all of these like crazy math libraries that academics talk about, they're basically just Fortran code. It's just Fortran code that they bind to, and these Fortran libraries are fucking ancient. Um, and I was like, hey, can we cross-compile this? Like, can we do something? Uh, how do we fix this? And so we had a long discussion about it. Uh, and just recently, because nobody could get mscripten with Fortran support to install except one person, he made a Docker image for it. So now anybody can run this Docker image. Uh, and uh, he actually cross-compiled all of these uh, ancient, for like uh, LawPack, the, this Fortran mega library uh, with mscripten. And, uh, and yeah, so any other problems that you think you know, the Noted community needs to address, you should bring up there. Uh, it's also a really nice repo to just watch in and participate in. Um, another one, uh, which is also being uh, run by Rod Vag, is build. So the, the current build system for core is, I think it might just be down or it's just not running or whatever, but it's really not that reliable. So one, we want like a better automated build system for core that runs all of the tests. We want to get like you know performance tests running. We want to also when for every build of core, we should really be running like the npm tests, and we should really be running like the tests of the most popular modules out there, um, so that we know that we're not breaking something on top of Node, not just Node itself. Um, and so, and another thing is that we want it to be really robust, right? Like right right now, it's all on like one provider's infrastructure, and that's just not going to hold up. So um, like almost a dozen companies now have like given resources to this, you know, I gave some from DigitalOcean, but, you know, Voxer went and bought, like, Mac minis and put them in a data center for Mac testing. You know, we're getting, like, FreeBSD stuff in there. Um, IBM and SoftLayer threw in some resources. So we're getting a lot of people into this. Um, right now, it's, um, uh, what is that awful Java thing? Some awful Java CI. Um, but uh, Rod can't use anything in Java for long, too long before he rewrites it in Node. Uh, so there's, there's also an up and coming CI utility written in Node um, that we'll be probably switching to at some point. So you can go to that repo and pitch in if you're like a, a build person. Um, the roadmap. So it's been a complaint for as long as I've been working on Node stuff that um, Core is a very homogenous group of people. Um, and that's because, like, you know, to, to work on core, most of the people, especially the people that came early on, came from kind of server backgrounds and from really low level backgrounds. Um, and if you look at the growth, like, more than half of Node's usage is in front end tooling. Um, and so getting that feedback into the core group has been very difficult. Um, and it's been locked up in a lot of weird process. So we have this roadmap repo where we're sort of like asking questions and coming up with more creative ways of getting feedback from people so we can try to figure out what are the biggest issues that, that people need addressed in core so we can feed that into an eventual roadmap, right? But, but the, the purpose of the project now, and there's a couple threads on there that you can participate in, which is about figuring out what the biggest pain points are in Node from every different part of the community so that we can get all of that consolidated. Uh, and the last one, which is not actually on Node Forward, but is very important, uh, is called NAN. Worst name ever, Rod. Um, but so I, I, if you use any like uh, C libraries, uh, every major release of Node they break because V8 dramatically changes its API during every release. And so what we're trying to do, what NAN does basically is provides like enough surface area for most people to bind to um, that are doing like a native extension or a C extension, and it it straddles the different versions of V8 that are in major releases of Node. Um, and it's sort of like, you know, constantly getting like refactored and, and there's a lot of work going into it right now. But um, what we're hoping is that this kind of eventually becomes the unofficial sort of blessed way for you to do native add-ons um, if you can. There's always going to be a section of a native, like parts of native add-on that you may need to bind directly to V8. But the more that you can use this, the less pain that you'll go through during every major release of Node. Um, and the less pain that, you know, everybody who uses your module will go through. 
Um, so that's sort of a summary of, of the, the current work. Um, uh, that's me. I'm, I'm Michael Rogers, uh, and when I'm not running node events, uh, <laughs> I'm the director of evangelism at uh, DigitalOcean. Thank you.